You know, Pentecost Sunday is such a wonderful time for the church, or for the Pentecostal church anyway. But it's also, what many people don't know, a time of celebration for the Jews. Although they celebrate it for a different reason than what we do today, today is a day that they're celebrating, a day that they are praising God and giving God thanks. It was a day of remembrance for them. It was a holiday for them. And in their culture today, I have some friends that are in Israel, and he was talking about it. And they were getting ready for today to celebrate. And what a time to give thanks and give praise and give honor to God for what it means. Many people today look at this weekend as a holiday weekend because of Memorial Day, Day of Remembrance. But honestly, there's not a lot of remembering taking place tomorrow. Not really. People take it as a day, and I understand it. Kids are out of school. One more hoorah before the summer, which was always funny to me because for a pastor, summertime, I almost wish it'd stay winter all year round. Uh, Summertime, every weekend is a vacation. And uh, of course in summertime, everybody wants to, for some reason or another, take off their clothes, to run around half dressed. At least in the wintertime, it's cold enough they'll keep something on, amen? I was with my wife, we had to run up and take care of some business the other day and we was on our way back home and we actually had to run up to North Carolina and while I was up there it was raining and the temperature had dropped unreasonably and it was like 58 degrees and uh, I got tickled we were getting gas and getting ready to go and I thought my wife said look at that I said, that's about the craziest thing I ever seen in my life people were out there freezing to death and there was, a la- there was people ladies and men they have short shorts on but then they'd have a big old hoodie and Parker and covered up, and they were like this here. And I'm thinking, evidently ain't cold enough yet. It was crazy. Had flip flops on, but they had to put that jacket on. I, I just didn't understand it. It's amazing what people do. But I want to tell you what I've come to do. I've come to worship the Lord. And I can truly say, like the song they just sang, there is no place I'd rather be than in the house of the Lord today with the saints of God worshiping God. Amen. No place I'd rather be than giving him honor and glory. And I don't know about you, but if you'll let every distraction go, if you'll ever let every hindrance pass you by, and if you'll focus your mind on why you're here, Lord, I'm here to celebrate you. I'm here to praise you. I'm here to give thanks to you. I'm here to glorify you. I'm here to worship you. I want to tell you, you'll find there's no place you'd rather be than in his presence right now. Amen. So I don't know about you, but I'm looking for God to do something wonderful in the service. But I'm going to tell you, if you're not expecting something, you probably won't get anything. But if you can look, not to me, I'm just a man, but if you can look to him with expectation, I promise you this morning, you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I want to give you an opportunity to worship this morning, giving your tithes and your offerings. I thank God for this opportunity. I look so thankful for God's blessings upon my life and how he continues to bless me. And I want to give you that opportunity to worship in giving that he may bless you. Would you pray with me over this offering? Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Father, we thank you this time that has come. Father, it doesn't take away from the worship, but Father, it adds to the worship. It is a time that we can come to you and give, Father. For when we can come with a servant's heart and a giving heart, then we can receive from you the blessings that you have in store for us. So, Father, I pray today 
that you would bless this offering, that you would bless each and every individual here and bless those who give. Father, bless their gift and bless them. Father, pour upon them blessings that they cannot contain. And we'll give you thanks, we'll give you honor, we'll give you praise for it all. In Christ Jesus' name, and everyone said amen and amen. Worship and giving this morning. Has. <laughs> I said God already has done the impossible. He will continue to do the impossible. He is able to do the impossible. I want to tell you, I'm so thankful that he does the impossible. Amen. I want to ask you if you would to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 with me. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand to honor the reading of God's Word. For a few minutes, I want to speak to you on Simple Thought Pentecost. Where is the fire? Where is the fire? A very familiar passage of Scripture to the evangelical churches, to the Pentecostal churches, holiness churches. Acts chapter 2, the birth of the church, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, glory to God. I want you to notice this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Where is the fire today? Where is the fire? Father, I thank you for you can do the impossible. You can move the unmovable, Father. There is nothing that restrains your hand but you. Father, for you are more than able to do above and beyond all that we could ever think, hope, or imagine. Father, for you have the power, for you are the power. So, Lord, I pray now that you would just anoint these lips of clay that I may speak the words you would have me to speak and say that that you would have me to say. But anoint these ears of clay, Father, that we would hear what your Spirit has to say unto the church today. And speak to us through your word, Almighty God, I pray. And we will give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it all in Christ Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As I told you, today is a day of celebration for the Pentecostal and Holiness churches because today is Pentecost Sunday. But it is also a time of celebration for the Jews. It is a day of celebration for them for different reasons. But it is still a day of celebration to where they give thanks unto God and they praise God. The word Pentecost is a Greek word that is derived meaning 50. It means 50 days or 50th day after the Passover. It's 50 days from the time of the Passover when Jesus was crucified. It's 50 days from the time that we celebrated Easter. This time of Passover that has come. 50 days after, when you look at Pentecost, it's a time that the Jews celebrate as the first fruits, found in Numbers chapter 28 and 26, and you find it is also known as the Feast of Weeks according to Exodus, or the Feast of Harvest according to Deuteronomy. It was a day that was set aside by the Jews to celebrate and to worship God and to remember there were three particular reasons in which they were to give thanks to God and to praise God at Pentecost, the 50th. They called it, they didn't call it 50 or Pentecost in the Old Testament. They called it the weeks of harvest or the feast of harvest or the days of first fruit or the first of weeks. 
But it was a time that had been set aside 50 days from Passover. Why? Three main events that took place. Number one, that the 50th day after Passover was the first beginning of harvest. It was the to, the children of Israel were to give thanks for the first uh, uh, the days of feast for the uh, first fruits because it was the first grain offering that would be received. They would start the day after to harvest the first of the grain offerings. And so it was always known as the first fruits uh, or the week of first fruits or the week of feast. And they would celebrate because the Lord Lord had given them a harvest. But there were two other reasons that were even greater that the Jews had set aside to celebrate this day that we call Pentecost. The second reason, according to Deuteronomy 16 and 12, was that the Jews were to remember the Exodus, the day of deliverance from the Israel uh, of Israel from the nation of Egypt. When they were in bondage, the people were told in Deuteronomy 16 to remember this day and to give thanks unto God for he had delivered them out of slavery because it was considered that this was the day of delivery to the Jews. Even though 50 days earlier they had left Egypt or had left slavery and began their journey, they had crossed over, but it had been a time, you see, in day, on day 25 they were at the Red Sea to cross the Red Sea, but it would be 25 more days before they would get to Mount Sinai and they were considered now free. Why? Because the Pharaoh's army had been destroyed in the Red Sea. The, the Israel had put Egypt far behind them. They were in the wilderness at Mount Sinai. And so now they were truly free and delivered. And so God said, set aside this day and remember this day as your day of deliverance. And so they remember the day that uh, the Jews were set free from Egypt's bondage. And they celebrated it on the 50th day or the days of uh, weeks or the days of first harvest. They called it the Feast of Weeks at that time simply because it was that time of the many weeks that they had traveled to get to their freedom. But there was a third reason why they were to give thanks and praise unto God. They were to give thanks according to Exodus 19 through 20 because this was the time the 50th day was the day that they had they had set up camp at Mount Sinai and God had called Moses up on the mountain to give him the law of Israel. And the law and the commandments on how to build the tabernacle. And this was the birth of their nation. You see, they celebrated this time of the law giving because it represented the constitution of their people as a nation. What do you mean, pastor? They were not really a nation yet. They were a people of God, yes, but not a nation. Just like our 13 colonies were 13 colonies and people that had come together, but they were not truly a nation until they formed the constitution of law. And when they formed the constitution of law, that's why our preamble says, we the people of this United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice to ensure domestic tranquility. Why? You cannot truly become a nation until you have developed a constitution of law in man's sight. And so, when God called them up on the Mount Sinai after 50 days, after being delivered and set free there are the weeks of harvest, 50 days after Passover to give them the law and to give them uh, the government and to give them uh, the tabernacle and the ways of worship. This was their constitution of when they truly became the nation Israel in the sight of the world and in the sight of God. And so you have to understand that this day that we celebrate as Pentecost today for the Jews was a day that they celebrate their first harvest. Tomorrow begins the harvest in Israel. Tomorrow begins their first fruits of their first harvest. Uh, today, they celebrate that uh, as the week of a uh, uh, feast uh, they, of the week of harvest. Uh, today, they celebrate that because uh, they know that they were set free uh, from Egypt's bondage. Uh, and 50 days ago, uh, they were let leave. They were allowed to leave Egypt's bondage. And they remember that time. And they celebrate this uh, as their true time of freedom. But they also recognize that this is the time that God called Moses up on the mountain and gave him the Torah, their law, and they became a nation. So today is a day of celebration for God's people, but it is a greater celebration for the church today because
because in the New Testament, the Bible says this was the birth of the New Testament church. This was the beginning of the outpouring of God's Spirit. It was this day in Acts that we look at that God said, I'm going to give you a new reason to praise and give thanks to me. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit in a new and more powerful way that there's never been given before and the church will be birthed. It was the tongues of fire that appeared that symbolized the presence of the Holy Spirit which was to dwell in the midst of God's people and the church was birthed in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came but it did not stay in the upper room. What happened? When the fire fell they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance but what happened more than that is they came out of the upper room. They could not stay locked away. They could not stay hidden away. They could not stay out of sight. All of a sudden the church was birthed and they came out with boldness speaking in tongues and prophesying and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and Peter began to lift up his voice and said you men of Judea and Jerusalem and all Samaria these men are not drunk as you suppose see it is but the third hour of the day but these men are full of the Holy Ghost that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your young men shall see visions and your old men will dream dreams upon my men servant and my maid servants will I pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy and whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved he brought the church and the church was birthed people say wait a minute pastor I thought the church began when on Calvary I thought the church began at resurrection oh let me tell you the foundation was laid at Calvary the promise was given at resurrection but it was on Pentecost Sunday when the power of God fell and filled the church with the fire of the Holy Spirit that the New Testament church was birthed and that we celebrate Pentecost Sunday today why because in Luke three sixteen, Jesus said himself he said I indeed baptize you with water or excuse me uh, John said I indeed baptize you with water but the one mightier than me is coming and he whose sandal straps I am not worthy to loose he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire in John 14 16 Jesus said I will pray to my father and he will give you another helper he is able who he may be that he may be able to abide with you forever he is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive neither can it see him nor does it know him but you know him and he will dwell with you and will be in you the promise of the Holy Spirit was given and on Acts they saw that promise come they saw the promise of the fire but something has happened over the ages over the time that has come the fire seems to have gone out in some ways I look across the churches today and I ask this question where is the fire what's happened to the fire let me tell you something church Jesus said you shall receive the Holy Spirit and fire the Holy Spirit came with the sound of a mighty rushing wind and cloven tongues of fire glory to God it wasn't the fire but it was the Holy Spirit but where the Holy Spirit was there was fire in fact if you begin to study the Bible all the way back to Genesis you will find that fire represents the Spirit of God. And all through the Bible, there is fire burning, and the fire is found. In fact, if you want to do a study, over 587 times is the fire mentioned in the Bible. I want to tell you something. And when the fire is mentioned, you need to pay attention because most of the time, there is a work of the Holy Spirit being done where there is fire. Glory Glory to God, even when it's not, uh, was it created by uh, God, but by man. Uh, in other words, where the enemy meant it for evil, evil, God will come in and take over the fire. Why? Because the fire represents his spirit. The fire represents his presence. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about like the fire the three Hebrew children were thrown into. Uh, the king said heat it seven times hotter. There was a fire built. Glory to God, and it was built for destruction. But 
what happened when the three who boys were thrown into the fire? Jesus showed up in the midst of the fire, glory to God, and the fire could not hurt them. Why? Because the presence of the Lord God Almighty is in the fire. I got to tell you something. He tells us in Isaiah, he said, when you pass through the waters, they shall not harm you. The rivers shall not overflow you, and the fire shall not burn you. Why? Because God has control of the fire. Can somebody say amen? When you look at the fire in the Bible, in the fact, the Bible makes it very plain. If you want to mark this or highlight this or if you're taking notes, let me tell you what God said about himself. In Hebrews 12, 29, he said, our God is a consuming fire. Glory to God. And he takes that from Exodus and Leviticus where he said, I am a consuming fire, a jealous God. In other words, he has the fire that is there. In Exodus 24, 17, the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. When they saw the Spirit of God descend, they saw it in the form of a fire. In Deuteronomy 4 and 12, I didn't get all the scriptures this morning, but I wanted to give you just a few. In Deuteronomy 4 and 12, the Bible said, the Moses reminded the people, said, remember, the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire, and you heard the sound of of his words. You saw no form, but you heard his voice coming out of the fire. Glory to God. All through the Bible, the fire has represented the Spirit of God. And I want to tell you something. Why? Why is fire so important? I started to bring some candles in this morning, but I said no, because if I get excited, I might knock some of them over. But if you light a candle, or you light a fireplace or anything, and set it on fire, there's something you got to understand fire is living it cannot live without oxygen it cannot burn without oxygen it has to have oxygen just like you and I do y'all didn't hear me fire has to have oxygen just like you and I do. Honey, if you take and put me in a vacuum, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suffocate. Amen? You take and close up a, a, a candle and put it in a bag or some container that is sealed tightly where there is no oxygen. When the oxygen is gone, the fire will go out. Oh, you didn't hear me. I said if you take away the oxygen, what is the breath of God, the spirit of God? He breathed into us and we became a living soul. The fire will go out. I don't think some of y'all are with me this morning. Y'all better get with me. This is my first Sunday back. I might preach a long time. Hello. I'm telling some of you need to wake your neighbor up right now. Tell them, say, you better wake up. I don't want to be here at 2 o'clock. Oh, come on. I want to tell you about the fire. When you take the oxygen away from the fire, fire can not burn. In fact, you know, we put out, we think about putting out fire a lot of times with water, and water does put out fire, but there are some fires you can spray water on it all you want, and you can't put it out. Why? Because there's not enough water to smother it. It can't smother it. It'll wet it, but it'll keep on burning. Napalm like that will burn. You can you can take napalm, and you can pay, put all the water, pour all the water you want on it, and it will not go out. In fact, they taught us in the military, they said if you ever get hit with napalm, or, 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 or one of the flash grenades, he said, how do you deal with it. You can't just pour water. It'll keep burning until it burns right through your flesh all the way through. You know what they tell you to do? They tell you to pour the water out on the ground. Make some mud and grab that mud and slap the mud on it and smother it. Because why? When you take the oxygen away, it can not burn. It dies. Can I tell you something, church? Fire represents the Holy Spirit of God. And let me tell you what's wrong with the church today. The enemy has come in and smothered the church. He's put a wet blanket over the church. He's caused people to draw back from the Spirit of God, and the fire has begun to go out. And we've got a lot of churches that have the symbol of the fire on their sign. We got a lot of churches that talk about the fire. We got a lot of churches that sing about the fire. But I'm looking at the church and saying, Where is the fire? I don't see the fire burning. Because when I tell you today, when the fire burns, there's going to be some evidence of it, there's going to be some heat, there's going to be some it's going to consume something. Hello? It's going to spread. It's going to move. It's going to, you, let me tell you something. You can't control the fire. God controls the fire. The fire that begins to burn 
It was there for a purpose. Let me tell you something about the fire. The first thing you need to know about the fire is the fire cleanses and anoints. I don't think you heard me. I said the fire cleanses and anoints. If you read a little story in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, I was trying to figure out last night all the references of fire, and if I had to put all of them in here, we'd be here all day because there are literally over 587 references of fire in the Bible. I said, my Lord, I, I didn't realize how much the fire is needed in the church today and why God used the symbol of fire when his spirit came. He wanted the people to know the fire is a living burning spirit of God it's there to work in our midst and to do something but we cannot smother the Holy Spirit we will put it out the Holy Spirit is a gentleman he will not stay where he is not wanted and too many people today are so concerned about what the world thinks they're afraid to let the fire burn in their life but I've come to tell somebody today I want the fire of God to burn in our church I want the fire of God to burn in our lives I want the people to see the smoky haze of the Holy Spirit moving once again in the lives of people, can somebody say amen? In Isaiah chapter 6, there's a wonderful story. But I want you to look at verses 5 and 7. 5, 6, and 7, the Bible said, whenever Isaiah saw God, Isaiah a prophet, Isaiah, glory to God, he was of the Levites. He was a prophet. He was an advisor to the king. He was a holy man and a righteous man of the law. He was, a, you could say, a pastor. But when he saw God, when he had a vision of God, he said, I ain't good enough. There's something wrong with me. And the Bible said he cried out, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts let me tell you something he knew when he saw God that he wasn't worthy to see God he wasn't worthy to be in God's presence he wasn't good enough to be in God I got news for you I don't care how long your grandmama was a member of the church I don't care what your mama and daddy did for the church I don't care what you've done if you ain't got the Holy Spirit, there ain't none of us worthy to stand in his presence. There ain't none of us worthy to be before him. And when he comes in the clouds of glory, honey, you know why he's going to rapture us when the rapture takes place, why he's going to take us up? Because we're not worthy to go to him. He's got to pick us up and take us, glory to God. We're not worthy. Isaiah saw it. Isaiah said, woe is me. You would think Isaiah was a righteous man and able. Isaiah was by man's standard. But Isaiah said, I'm not worthy. I am not even worthy to look at him. I'm not worthy to be in his presence. But I want you to notice verse 6. Then one of the cherubims flew to me, having in his hand a living coal or a living fire, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, living. In other words, it was burning. You could, it hadn't been smothered. It hadn't been put out. It was burning. It was alive. And notice what he said and he said in verse 7 and it touched my mouth with it and behold as he touched my lips he said unto me behold this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sins purged let me tell you God will use fire of the spirit to clean you up whenever there's something wrong in your life Zechariah 13 and 9 he said I will bring one third through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested then they will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say this is my people each one will say the Lord is my God you can't really call on him and know him until the fire gets a hold of you glory to God let me tell you something church it is the spirit of God that draweth us to him when we look at Ezekiel chapter 20 47 through 48 he said but from, say to the far to the, the south hear the word of the Lord thus saith the Lord God behold I will kindle a fire in you and it shall devour every green tree and every dry tree in you a blazing fire, fire flame uh, shall not be quenched uh, listen he said I'm going to kindle a fire and it shall not be quenched uh, it's a fire that's going to spread in verse 48 he said all flesh shall see it and know that I am the Lord that hath kindled it and it shall not be quenched uh, I want to tell you a fire comes uh, and consumes the offering a fire cleanses uh, 
a fire anoints. In First Kings 18, then Isaiah was, excuse me, Elijah was there praying, and he built an altar. And the Bible said he prayed a 63-word prayer, and fire fell from heaven. The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Listen to what happened when the fire fell. The Bible said then all the people who saw it fell on their face and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Can I tell you what fire does? When it begins to cleanse and anoint, it brings about revival in the hearts and lives of people. You want to know why churches are dead? You want to know why churches are falling apart? Because they don't have the fire in them anymore. We need to go back to the altar and start saying, Lord, send the fire one more time. Let the fire fall again in our midst. Let it start with me. You know what happens with a fire? If something catches on fire, it has to be contained in an area. If you put it in the fireplace or, or you put it in the fire pit with the wood, the fire burns right there. But what happens if you get too close to the fire? What happens if you take another stick and you stick it and hold it into the fire? It will spread from that. What do you mean, Pastor? Come here, Justin, right here for a minute. If the fire falls on one, uh, glory to God, it'll burn. Uh, but come here, Brother Tom. Uh, if you get close to the fire, guess what? You begin to feel the heat of it. You begin to feel the presence of the fire. It gets hot. You ever been up too close to a fireplace? Had to back off. Uh, I remember in the military, we'd stand out in the cold, and we'd build a fire pit, and we'd be standing there in the snow, and it's freezing. And, and when I was overseas, and the fire would get so hot, we'd stand this way for a few minutes, and then we'd turn around and stand this way. Why? Because you'd get one side warm and the other side was cold. You were back. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on. But let me tell you something. We didn't reach in and touch the fire because we knew we'd get burned. But what happens if you take that stick or something and you reach over and touch the fire? If you get close enough, if you touch it, put your hand on the shoulder, guess what? The fire begins to spread from this stick to this one, from this bush to this one, from this piece of item to this one. In other words, it doesn't stay contained. Y'all ain't got this. In a hospital, they got something called fireproof doors. In the schools, they're supposed to have them. And you know what happened? If the fire alarm goes off, those doors automatically shut. Do you know why? They want to contain the fire in one area. And they turn on the sprinklers. Glory to God. When I was in the hospital uh, uh, a while back, uh, in fact, it was some of my members. Uh, they had got through visiting me, and they went out and got on the elevator, and they got stuck on the elevator between floors. And they set off an alarm. Now, it wasn't a fire alarm, but because they didn't know what was going on, guess what? The doors shut. The fireproof doors shut because they were getting ready just in case they were something wrong. They didn't want it to spread. And they were in the elevator. I don't know how long before uh, they, got take, they, they got them out of the elevator. But they were stuck between floors uh, in the elevator. Glory to God. Uh, and you know why? I got the feeling the devil's put some fireproof doors in the church. Uh, and I'm ready to kick them open uh, because he's put them in there to try to stop the fire from spreading. Uh, but I don't want to stop the fire from spreading. I want to kick those doors open because I want the fire to get on somebody. And if it'll get on one person, then maybe it'll get on a second. If it'll get on a second, then maybe a third. And if a third, then maybe a fourth. And before you know it, the whole church will be on fire for God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let it spread. Next thing you notice about fire, God uses fire, the Holy Spirit, to guide and direct. Hello. Now, that, there's the problem right there. Now I'm finna get nosy. Uh -huh. This is our problem. We don't need nobody to guide us and direct us. Come on now. Every one of us know how to do it ourselves, don't we? All right, gentlemen, let's be real. You love it when your wife tells you how to put it together. Come on. I mean, you're going, oh, thank you, honey. That was so sweet. I wouldn't have been able to do that if you hadn't showed me that. Come on. No, no, no. I've heard some of you. <laughs> 
She's tried to help. Honey, you need to do it this way. I've been there. What does she think? I don't know what I'm doing. I wish she, she needs to go on. Let, do her stuff. Let me do mine. Out there cooking. Honey, did you check that meat? I'm a better cook than she is. And she's asking me to check the meat. Come on. We don't like things that give us directions. Hello? How many of you got GPS in vehicles? You ever notice they give them a woman's voice preset? I ain't going to go there. Mine, I like to mess with mine. I mess her all up. I get on the road and start going somewhere, and she'll tell me which way to go, and I'll pass the turn where she tells me, in 500 meters, make a U-turn and turn light. I passed that one. In 500 meters, make a U-turn. I passed that one. In a half a mile, make a U-turn. I passed that one. In 300 feet, turn left. She starts getting cranky. Mess with her. Just do it. I, I'll program it to go home. Or you want to have fun? Get in your vehicle today and program it to go to the church while you're in the church parking lot. You'll mess that thing up. Wants to give you directions. We don't want directions. We don't want people to guide us. We want to do it our own way. Glory to God. Uh, yeah, I, 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 sometimes we're going home, and if I want to go a different way than what I normally do, my wife says, where are you going? I'm going home. Why don't you turn back there? God, I don't want to turn back there. I want to go this way. That way's father. By half a minute. But it's okay. We don't want nobody to tell us how we're supposed to do it. And I don't think there's a reason why we're smothering the fire in the church. Because you see, there's a problem. God's not going to let you go the way you want to go if you're going to follow him. I didn't think you heard me. I said God's not going to let you go the way you want to go if you're going to follow him. He's going to give you directions and say, this is the way you're supposed to follow me. You see, the Bible tells me there's a pathway, the straight and the narrow that we need to get upon, but we cannot get upon it unless we follow the fire that will guide us. You see, the children of Israel didn't want to follow the fire. The Bible said that God sent a fire, and if you go back and read in Exodus Chapter 13 and verse 1, the Bible said that God told Moses, he said, I'm going to lead the children in a different way. I'm not going to lead them the way they think, but I'm going to lead them way by the wilderness, by the Red Sea, because I've got a plan. I've got a purpose. I'm going to get vengeance on Pharaoh. And the Bible said, I'm going to lead them. And he put a pillow of cloud by day and a pillow of fire by night to lead the people and he led them out there and they camped out at the Red Sea for seven days and what were they doing? They were fussing and complaining you've led us out here that we can die. Here comes Pharaoh. We're going to die. But God had a plan. God had a purpose. You see the Spirit of God will guide you. The Bible said he did not take away the pillow of cloud by day or the pillow of fire by night from before his people. But he guided them. He led them. He wanted to give them direction. God had a reason for them going that way. If you look in Angel chapter, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 3 verse 2 the Bible said the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush and when Moses looked on the bush behold the bush was burning with fire but it was not consumed and what did God say? God told him said do not draw near this place but take off the sandals of your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. He said listen I have seen the suffering of my people come now therefore I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people out. The children of Israel out of Egypt. God had a purpose. God had a plan. God had a reason for the fire. He let the fire burn so he could get his attention. But when the fire was burning, he gave him direction. He gave him a way to go. He said, listen, I'm going to guide. I'm going to direct. I'm going to lead. You know what led them out of the upper room? It wasn't themselves. They were in the upper room praying. But when the cloven tongues of fire lit upon every one of them, they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave us read the next part and the Bible says and they came out of the upper room they were led by the fire of God can I tell you God doesn't want you to stay where you are God doesn't want to leave you in the place you are but God wants to guide you out and we'll only be led out when the fire begins to burn in our lives again my Lord I'm tired of dead churches I'm tired of people that don't want the Holy Ghost I'm tired of people that don't want the Spirit of God to move if you don't want that go somewhere else but let me tell you what I 
want is the fire of God to burn in our midst again to guide and lead us where he wants us to go, to take us in the direction he wants us to go. I'm tired of the status quo. Honey, if you want something to happen, let the fire start to burn. When the fire starts to burn, it will move and it will move people out. Anybody ever been in a place that was on fire? Anybody? I promise you, you won't stay in the building if it's burning. Y'all didn't hear me. You won't stay in the building if it's burning. Now, I don't know y'all go out here and try to set the church on fire. I ain't talking about natural fire. I'm talking about spiritual fire. But if the fire starts burning in the church, can I tell you something? You ain't going to stay in the building. Y'all didn't hear me. You're not going to stay in the building. It's going to, there'll be two groups getting out of the church when the fire starts burning. The first group is the group running from it. Hello? Because they don't want to give up to God. But the second group is going to be the group that's caught on fire. And they want to spread the good news to everybody they meet. They want to do the work of the Lord. They want to minister. They want to move out. You see, the fire, man, I want to tell you something. It will guide you and move you. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. I love this one here. Old Jeremiah, you know what? They had tried to smother the fire. And Jeremiah tried to smother the fire. Jeremiah got to pouting. Jeremiah got upset. They threw him in a pit. They had, they had been mean to him. They would locked him up. They didn't want to hear what God had to say. And Jeremiah's feelings got hurt. And so when they threw Jeremiah in the pit, Jeremiah started pouting. And listen to what the Bible said. He said, I will not make mention of him no more, nor will I any more speak his name. He said, I'm through. I ain't going to have nothing to say. God, I'm finished. But I like this. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. Did you hear me? You see, when the fire gets shut up in your bones, you won't. He said, I love this part. He says, and I became weary of holding it back. He said, I was trying so hard to stop that fire, but that fire was burning in me. And he said, I got tired of trying to hold it back. And he said, and I could not hold it back any longer. Honey, when the fire gets in you, it will move you out. The fire, it tests and empowers us. Jesus said in Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Forest fires, when they're out of control and burning, they try to get out in front of them to stop them or slow them down, but they cannot control them where they're at. They have to get ahead of them. They have to try to dig trenches. They have to make fire breaks. They have to do everything they can to get ahead of it, to slow it down. And even sometimes they can't do that, and all they can do is say, get out of the way. It's coming through. It burns with power. It burns with authority. They can't stop it. Years ago, back in the 80s, out in the great redwood forest, I don't remember if y'all, any of y'all remember this, and it was in, I think it was in 86, may have been before that, but they had the great redwood forest fire, and the fire was burning through the redwoods, and the foresters got there, and they pulled everybody away and stopped fighting the fire, and people got mad. People was calling the government. People was calling everybody. News station said, why ain't they out there let, stopping that fire? It's going to destroy one of our national treasures, the great redwood forest. Those massive trees, it's going to destroy them. They got a forest ranger on there. 
And the forest ranger looked at him. He said, listen. He said, y'all need to stop calling. He said, we know what we're doing. We got this. Everything is under control. No, the woods or forest is burning down. He said, no, it's not. He said, our forest was actually dying. He said, but you don't understand. He said, the redwood forest, he said, the trees, when they drop their seeds, their seeds are surrounded by a hard crust. And he said, they fall to the ground and they cannot germinate. He said, but this fire that comes through, it's going to burn out all the bugs. It's burning out all the dead wood. But more than that, it's burning the crust off of those seeds. And what we will see is we're going to see new trees begin to grow. We're going to see new trees begin to be birthed. He said, so we want this fire to continue burning because what it is doing is bringing new life to the forest. You see, everybody thought it was being destroyed, but what it was actually doing was burning the crust off of the trees. Uh, actually, one of our, our uh, Ray H. Hughes' son, who used to be one of our overseers, Ray H. Hughes' son, was one of the men, he actually works with the, with the government, uh, and he was some kind of, whatever they did with nature and all that kind of stuff, but he's actually told him, he said, Daddy, he said, they tell the church, don't pray for the fire to start, to stop, pray for the fire to keep burning. He said, because it's doing a good thing. It's burning away the crust. My Lord, church, I got to thinking about it. You know what, God? We need the fire to burn in the church and burn away the crust so new life can come, so new things can happen. Glory to God. Uh, listen to me, church. Uh, Bible said in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grievously you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, though it is tested by the fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the restoration and revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, can I tell you, church, uh, there is a fire that needs to burn in the church again, uh, and we do not need to put it out. We need to let it burn. Uh, we need to let the fire come. We need to let the fire take place. I find in a story in Genesis chapter 22 in closing, one of the greatest miracles in the, time, in the Old Testament Bible, when a man named Abraham was taking his son to sacrifice his son because God had told him to, and he was heading up to the mountain of God, and the Bible said as he took the wood for the burnt offering, and he laid it on his son Isaac, and he took the fire in his hands. <laughs> he took the fire in his hands. The Bible said that Isaac looked at Abraham, his father, and said, Father, he said, here am I, my son. He said, look, I have the wood and you have the fire, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Glory to God. Do you hear me? He said, I've got the wood, you got the fire. Where's the lamb? And Abraham's response was this, don't worry, son. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Glory to God. But he already had the fire with him in his hand. What are you saying, pastor? He was being obedient to the Holy Spirit of God. When he got up on that mountain, what happened? He drew his back, hand back. He still had the fire. He hadn't started anything yet. But when he drew his hand back, God said, Abraham, Abraham, do thy son no harm. He said, for now I see that you will withhold nothing from me. You're obedient. And guess what God did? God said, look over on the other side of the mountain in the thicket. There's a lamb for sacrifice. God had provided. He still needed the fire. You know what happened? Abraham met Jehovah, the, the God provider, Jehovah Jehovah the Lord our provider. He met him that day on the mountain of God. Why? Because he had the fire in his hand. I want to tell you something, church. That spiritual fire is obedience. That spiritual fire will direct you in the paths you need to go. That spiritual fire will cause you to hunger and thirst for God. That spiritual fire will cause you to grow. That spiritual fire will move you when nothing else will move you. Can I ask you today, where is the fire in your life? Has the fire gone out or do you still have the fire burning in your heart. Stand with me all over this house. Pentecost Sunday. We get to talking about the speaking in tongues. The speaking in tongues was a sign of the Holy Spirit. 
it wasn't what Pentecost was about. Pentecost was about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was came in the form of cloven tongues of fire. As it sat upon each one of them, they were filled. Listen to me, church. That fire represents the power of God. Old Testament, New Testament. The fire of God burned. God said, I will pour out my spirit, my presence. It's like a fire. A fire that should be burning spiritually in our midst, in our church, in our home, in our families. I don't know about you, but I don't want the fire just at church. I want the Holy Spirit, I want the fire to burn in my home, in my life, wherever I am, in my family. Wherever I go, whatever I do. And if the fire is burning in you, let me tell you something. If the fire is burning in you, if you get around, glory to God, someone, that fire can catch. Someone told me, they were kind of being smart, said, Pastor, you can't burn wet wood. That's true. But if your fire's hot enough, it'll dry their wet wood out. Then you can burn. When I was a boy, we built a fire. The fireplace, they had dry wood to start the fire. And Steve, they had some green wood, and sometimes they have a little wet wood that had gotten damp or wet. It wasn't ready to burn. You know what we did? We'd take it to the fireplace. We'd lay it out where it could dry out. And when that fire got hot enough, it dried out, and you could put the green and the wet on there, and it burned it. So maybe we ought to be saying, God, let my fire burn hot enough that if I got any wet wood around me, if I got any wet wood, it'll dry it out, and you can burn. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. How many of you want the Spirit to burn in your life? I want to tell you something. My wife and I, she loves candles. I love, love them too. And we'll burn them and, and burn them. And she'll get in there and trim the wicks. And we'll burn those candles all the way down to the jar until they ain't nothing but that little metal piece holding the wick left. But when it burns, when it gets down to that point, I'm getting that jar because she'll burn it all the way down to the metal, I'm telling you. But when it gets down there where it's still a little bit of flame and I can start seeing the metal, I'll slip in there and grab the jar and go throw it in the trash. And I'll put a new candle out for her so we can light those and they can burn. I like to keep the candle burning, the fire burning. And I found out something. Some of us, our wicks burnt down. We ain't got much fire left. But if you'll let God this morning, he'll change it out for you. And you'll burn again with the Holy Spirit. If that's your desire, if you really want God to burn in your life and your family, you want God to rekindle the fire in you, I invite you to come and pray this morning. These altars are open. Take a moment and seek God and say, God, a lot of fire in me because I don't know about you I don't want my fire to go out you're welcome to come God bless you